Well, hi there. I'm here with my beautiful jungle carpet python, who I am so glad is with us today because I almost lost him. And I was really sad because I, I honestly wasn't sure if he was going to make it or not. Uh, I should probably tell you what happened because I think this is something that's really valuable for a lot of people. Uh, I got him several months ago and he was actually in great health, looked a lot like he does right now. He seemed to be doing really, really terrific and I, I brought him home and I, I put him in quarantine, uh, which is definitely a practice you should do if you've got multiple reptiles. And that is just that you should keep him away from any of your other reptiles for a period of time while you can monitor his health. And, and also, when you get a new reptile, you're probably going to want to leave it alone, at least until you can tell that it's eating and behaving normally. And so I had him in quarantine, and it took him a little bit to start eating for me. In fact, I, I hadn't uh, managed to get him to eat at all in about the first two weeks that I had him. Which, carpet pythons are notoriously good eaters, but two weeks is also not an alarming amount of time to go between feedings for a carpet python. Needless to say, though, I, I wasn't monitoring him very carefully because I was trying to just leave him alone until I could get him to start eating. And he hadn't started eating yet. And one day I went to check on him, and I thought when I first saw him that he might already be dead. Uh, his color wasn't right. His, he wasn't holding his jaws together right. He had a little bit of a mucusy discharge in the corners of his mouth and and he had substrate in his mouth and he was just laying in a way that just you could tell he wasn't right but I I, I, mean, I immediately responded to him and and he moved so he was alive uh, and and I you know I picked him up and started to inspect him and and he actually started to uh, show that he, he actually had quite a bit of vigor but he definitely wasn't right at all. And it became very apparent as I listened to him breathe and saw that mucusy discharge and the fact that he was keeping his mouth open that he had a respiratory infection. And uh, I really am glad I get a chance to talk to you guys about respiratory infections because they're one of the more common ailments that you're going to encounter with reptiles in general and, and with snakes. I actually reference them in quite a few of our videos that you're going to want to do things to avoid the possibility of respiratory infections. And that was something that he had. And it was probably something due just to the stress of being moved. Symptoms of a respiratory infection. Uh, these are things I've seen uh, and, and maybe a few things that I've never seen, but I, people talk about. One thing that people talk about a lot is bubbling, bubbling from their mouth or nose. I've never had a snake with a respiratory infection where they showed that particular symptom. But like I said, they, he had a kind of a brownish mucusy discharge in the corners of his mouth which is probably related to that sort of bubbling. Um, just when you really hear them breathing loudly, especially, you know, sometimes you'll hear that with really big snakes, uh, just from normal breathing, but a snake this size, you shouldn't really be able to hear it breathe, generally speaking. I could hear him breathing very clearly. Um, gaping. If they're keeping their mouth open to breathe, they've almost certainly got a respiratory infection. And something else I've noticed is sometimes they'll just hold their neck extra straight. You know, the, the rest of their body would be coiled normally, but they've just got their head out straight about all the time. And that's probably just because they're trying to keep their airway straight and clear because they're struggling to breathe. Uh, like I said, you know, a respiratory infection is essentially the same as, as a cold for you. It's just these colds are frequently lethal. For reptiles it's it's just a lot more dangerous for them than it is for you and so it is something that is worth taking them to the vet not to mention that you will save that reptile but these respiratory infections can be very contagious and so if you can get the first reptile taken care of it, you might be able to prevent it from spreading through your collection needless to say if one of your animals has a respiratory infection keep that animal quarantined don't handle your other animals after handling that one you just try to keep it as separate as possible from any other reptiles in your collection until it is completely well for quite a while. Um, a lot of times respiratory infections can be corrected just by correcting husbandry. 
you know, you might not have your humidity or temperatures right. You generally want to boost temperatures and get your humidity on point. And so that is always the first thing to do, but I was pretty confident in his temperatures and humidity. And, and it has been my experience that when that is the only thing that you do, sometimes they get better, and that's fantastic, and sometimes they do not, and you've wasted time. And, and so it's a little bit risky just seeing if that, that will fix it, but uh, sometimes it does. However, what, what I elected to do was to schedule an appointment with the veterinarian as soon as I could, so I scheduled an appointment with my, my local reptile vet, and I was very disappointed to hear that I couldn't get in until the following day. I wanted to be in that same day, um, but they didn't have any, any times available. And I was worried he wouldn't even make it until the next day, because like I said, when I first saw him, I wasn't sure if he was alive then. And, and a respiratory infection for a snake, for any reptile, is essentially like having a cold. Uh, so, you know, what, what's happening is uh, you can usually tell they've got a respiratory infection because they're breathing loudly, they might be gaping, keeping their mouth open when they breathe, and that is actually why he'd taken on the substrate into his mouth. And so I was able to do some things to respond. I was able to get him a, a warm soak. You know, you ba basically you take a tub and you, you fill it with water that is warm but not hot. You don't want to boil your snake cook your snake, but, but a warm soak, and what I did is I'd, I'd put him in that tub and I'd, I'd close the lid, of course you want to have enough space so he can breathe, and then I also uh, soaked the, the tub that he's soaking in in another warm water bath in a sink so it wouldn't cool because if you let it get too cold while he's still in it, that can actually cause major problems, and so I didn't want to make things worse, but I wanted to make sure he was well hydrated. And, and this can also help with the cold that he has. And the next day I got him to the vet. And, uh, you know, I, I was able to tell him uh, that, you know, I, I had, a, he had, a, he had a respiratory infection and, and that I needed an antibiotic for it. Though there are respiratory infections that can be caused by, by viruses, in which case an antibiotic won't help. But generally speaking, an antibiotic is what you're going to need to take care of a respiratory infection. And I, rec I requested an oral antibiotic. There are kind of two different ways that you can go about this. One of them is an injected antibiotic. So you would be giving your snake shots. Uh, the alternative is an oral antibiotic. And I requested the oral antibiotic Batril to give to him. And the vet, after examining him, concurred that he did have a respiratory infection and, and he gave me the antibiotics that I would need. And so at that point, I began a, a two-week treatment using the Batril, and you give them a, a certain amount with a, a, a syringe, and you give that to them based on their weight. And so he was taking uh, his treatment, and what, what's really important when giving antibiotics is that you do it at about the same time every day, and that you do the full amount. And this is, this is where people make mistakes a lot of the time, because after a, a few days, maybe a week, He's going to be over it. He's going to look good, right? And, and you're going to think everything's, everything's hunky-dory. And a lot of people quit administering or taking antibiotics at that point. And the problem is you've killed most of the bacteria. That's why you get better. But some are still alive. And the ones that are still alive include any oddballs that happen to be resistant to your antibiotic. And their numbers are still high enough that they could recover and now recover with a much higher percentage being totally resistant to that antibiotic than you had before. And so if you stop, suddenly the disease will come back. And if you try to use that antibiotic again, there's a very good chance that they will now be a resistant strain. And that's how you end up with resistant bacteria. They will have evolved. And it's your fault because you didn't finish off that antibiotic. So for two full weeks, including with a fairly healthy carpet python, and carpet pythons are not notorious for having great personalities, they're kind of notorious for being a little bit grumpy, though that's probably not deserved, as we covered in our video about carpet pythons. It's right there. I was so impressed by him, because even when he regained his strength, he never attempted to bite me. And, and what I was doing to him is pretty invasive. I haven't yet described how it is that you administer an oral antibiotic. Uh, this meant that I had to grab him every day. 
This is a snake I, that he, he'd been handled before he had a great personality, but I hadn't handled him very much. And now I'm really aggressively handling him and I'm having to grab him by the head, essentially, right behind his head. And then I'm having to take a syringe and rub it in his mouth until he gets annoyed enough that he opens his mouth. And then I'm having to jam this syringe, not too far, and I'm doing it actually very carefully, so jam isn't the right word, but I have to slide this syringe a little bit down his throat so that I can inject it in there and he won't spit it out. A really nice thing with snakes when it comes to administering an antibiotic or anything oral like this is the fact that their trachea, which, which is connected to their lung or lungs, it, it actually comes out farther up in their mouth and it has an extendable tube. And so there's no chance of accidentally injecting that into that tube unless you stuck it in that tube. As long as you start it at the back of their mouth, which is well past where their trachea is, you can actually just inject it down their throat and there's no chance they can choke on it. That's fantastic. But I was doing this to him every day and then after I inject it, I have to hold his head upright until I make sure that he swallows. And then I can put him away. Uh, and I'm also jamming him in a box full of water every few days to give him a soak to make sure he's staying hydrated because that's also really important. I'm being extremely, uh, what would otherwise be abusive with a snake. I mean, you know, this would be ex an extremely rude way to treat your snake and most snakes wouldn't put up with this. Well, for two full weeks, he put up with this garbage from me and never once did anything defensive. I mean, he would try to flee a little bit, but he never tried to bite me. He never even showed me a posture like he was thinking about it. And after he got some of his strength back, he started eating again. Uh, he, he began by eating mice and then picked up to eating medium rats and he is the best snake ever to feed. I love him because I don't even have to shake a mouse in front of him. I just drop it in there and he comes up and swallows it and that is lovely. I don't have too many snakes to do that. My false water cobra will do that and, and this guy does that. The, the blood python. Actually, three of the snakes I have with the worst reputations are some of the best ones I have when it comes to feeding. But he has now recovered completely and I'm loving him, I'm, but I'm so glad he made it through this. I should tell you, one of the big things that discourages people from taking animals to the vet, and honestly one of the things that has discouraged me in the past is the cost. You know, I, I, I've always, oh, I've been a graduate student most of my adult life, and if you know anything about graduate students, it's that they're poor. Vet costs, though, are really not that bad, especially when compared to losing your animal which is a very strong possibility with something like a respiratory infection. You can just wait it out and hope for the best, but there's a very good chance your animal will die. And honestly, when it came to the cost of the vet visit and the medication that it took to get him better, we're talking like $90, which most reptiles cost more than that. I mean, just, just even if you don't care about your animal, just from a dollars and cents perspective, take them to the vet, get them taken care of, and then you'll get to enjoy them for years and years and years and they'll get to have the quality of life that they probably deserve as your pet. So hopefully this has been helpful for you when it comes to dealing with respiratory infections and really any major health concern that your animal might come across. Also thank you Patreon people. I will say this is because this is a fact. Patreon helped us get this snake so I can give you a good review and covered his vet bills. So. This snake owes his life to you. Thank you. As always, like and subscribe. And we hope to see you real soon. <laughs> what a goof. That's something tree snakes will do a lot because he's just looking for a branch or something. Yeah, if any part of him here. touches it, you know, he'll just he'll kind of hook his face around it. <laughs> Go for it.